Dear Frank, I once knew a pious old lady who never saw or heard anything in this world that did not put her in mind of Joseph in Egypt. Whenever anything was told her, no matter what, she would take a pinch of stuff and exclaim with a devotional air, Ah, that puts me in mind of Joseph in Egypt. Nobody could tell why, but so it was. In traversing this mountain region, one of the first things that struck me was the solemn, severe silence which prevailed everywhere and only broken at distant intervals by the note of the cock of the woods, the chirping of the ground squirrel, the crash of a falling tree, or the long echoes of a fowler's gun, which rendered the silence thus broken, in upon a moment still more striking. In many places, the only traces of human agency are the incisions of the sugar maple, and the little troughs at the foot of the tree turned upside down to await the flowing of the sap in the spring. In one of the taverns along the road, we were set down in the same room with a man who was an ill-looking, hard-featured, pockmarked, bearded fellow. He was going, it seems, to Richmond. All along the road, I made it my business to inquire where lived a man who might perhaps be tempted to sell me his slaves, and when I got some half a dozen of them, I tied their hands behind their backs and drove them three or four hundred miles or more, bareheaded and half naked. I gave out that they were runaway slaves. I was carrying them home to the masters. On one occasion, a black woman exposed his fallacy and told the story of her being kidnapped. And when I got her into a wood out of hearing, I beat her till her back was white. I married all the men and women I bought because they would sell better for being a man and wife. For many is a time, I've separated wives from husbands and husbands and wives and parents from children. But then I made amends by marrying them again as soon as I had a chance. I made one bad purchase there. I bought a young mulatto girl, a lovely creature, a great bargain. She'd been a favorite of a master who lately married. The difficulty was, was to get her to go, for she loved her master. However, I swore most bitterly that I was only going to take her to her mother. And she went with me, though she seemed to doubt me very much. But when she discovered at last that we were out of the state, I thought she would go mad, and in fact the next night drowned herself in the river close by. I lost a good five hundred dollars by this foolish trick. It is seldom we see the ties of kindred or of conjugal affection stronger than in the Negro. He will travel twelve, fifteen, or twenty miles to see his wife and children after his daily labor is over and return in the morning to his labor again. If he obtains his liberty, he will often devote the first years of his liberty to buying their freedom. 